Joseph. Joseph uh, has been the subject of uh, movies, uh, Broadway plays, and um, on and on and on. Unfortunately, some of these presentations about Joseph leave half of his life or three quarters of his life out because they don't do the research on his life where he grew up, which is in Egypt. You know, we have been ministering in Egypt now for 34 years. And that's given us the opportunity to really do some in-depth study uh, in, in subjects that we feel like that God wants us to be involved with. And one of those is the life of Joseph. Now, you're not going to find Joseph's story written as Joseph, unless you go to the American University or the British University. But you will find a wealth of information about Joseph uh, under his Egyptian name and under the special name that Pharaoh uh, called him. And so this next four weeks, we are going to be talking about Joseph and the Joseph of the of Genesis that you're well aware of. But we're going to not only look at what the Word of God, what the Bible says about him, but we're going to also uh, dive into what Egyptian history says about him. And I will warn you in advance that it's very, very fascinating, to say the least. And um, it is it, far more than a 17-year-old boy being sold into slavery and then uh, eventually um, being placed in the position of, of a prime minister. I mean, it's, um, uh, it's you, you can see God's hand along the way even though Joseph himself did not recognize it at the time. Of course, we'll get into all that as we go. But um, but we're doing this not to try to belittle the Word of God, but to enhance. I think I've told you before, perhaps, that archaeology and history does not prove that the Bible is correct. But what archaeology and history does, it confirms that the Word of God has always been correct. And that's what we find in the book of uh, Genesis concerning Joseph. Nothing that we'll be talking about over the next four weeks is going to dispute what is written about Joseph in the Word of God. But uh, rather than just giving you a single flower, a single rose, with the Egyptian history behind us, we'll give you a, an entire bouquet that uh, fits together and complements one another. <clears throat> so, to get started, I'll... Uh, I'm going to draw you a map of, of, uh, of Egypt. <clears throat> okay, this is the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And this is Cana, where jo uh, Jacob and his family was located. Now, Cana was not an independent country. It was a colony of Egypt and had been a colony of Egypt for uh, almost 150 years, uh, or actually closer to 200 years. And so it was like, it was like um, uh, America in its relationship with, 
I like Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico is uh, Amer American territory, but it's independent to, uh, um, so they can make their own decisions. Well, Kenya was the same way. And um, it was, um, but what made that one difficult is because they had a number of, of uh, uh, races and, and, uh, and multi-races of people that were trying to uh, come under the rule of Egypt. And they, they did very well. And so at this time, at the time that Joseph was, was born, and Joseph was born in the year 1875 B.C., and um, Jacob was 90 years old at the time. And you can find uh, his birth, Genesis 30, uh, 24, 22 through 24. And um, his mother, Rachel, uh, later had a, uh, another uh, son, uh, Benjamin, and she died uh, when she was giving birth to this, um, to this son. Now, uh, Jacob uh, loved uh, Rachel um, as his favorite wife. Of course, you know, you have the, you have the two wives and then you have the concubines, and, uh, which were considered uh, with the same privileges as a wife. And so uh, Jacob had a lot to, to choose from. <clears throat> but he was, uh, Rachel was his favorite. And because Rachel was his favorite, then uh, Joseph, uh, but until the birth of, of uh, Benjamin, was his favorite son. And perhaps even afterwards, he was still a favorite son. And so, <clears throat> so it was a, um, it, it, it was a relationship that was good for Joseph and, uh, and perhaps good for Jacob but certainly not for the rest of the family. <clears throat> the uh, Nile Delta is here with the Nile River. <clears throat> this is the city of On. City of Thebes. Which was about 460 miles uh, south. <clears throat> when uh, the main road that went from Cana to uh, Egypt was uh, one that was called the Ways of Horus. You had the the Red Sea, this is the uh, the Gulf of Suez. And the Gulf of Aqaba. And this is the Sinai Peninsula of this area. <clears throat> now, like I said, at the time, uh, Egypt controlled the world, uh, controlled all the, the known world until we get to Mesopotamia. Now, uh, in this area, you have the the bitter lakes, they call it, the small bitter lakes and the, and the upper uh, bitter lakes, which we'll get to a little bit later on. But in the year 2057 BC, there was a peace agreement that was made between Babylon or the, um, the government of Babylon or the country of Babylon and Egypt. And this was the first uh, peace agreement that was ever made uh, after the flood of Noah. And uh, so it was quite, it was quite unique uh, because they chose to come together uh, as equals. Now, this particular, um, this particular peace agreement was brokered by 
by Terah, which was the father of Abraham. And uh, the peace agreement was quite unique because it separated the responsibilities of the governments over the people. With this agreement, Babylon became uh, became the the leader of uh, uh, legal issues. Um, if you had a piece of property, you had to register your property uh, in uh, in Ur, which was the capital city of Babylon. Egypt was in charge of commerce, trade, and that type of thing. And so they were responsible to make sure that the entire known world, um, in which they were, um, they, they were, they were governors of that world, um, was, was, re- received the right, um, uh, the right acceptance that everybody was, was governed equally. And so Egypt was in, in charge of all the trade and commerce and registration in that way. Ur or Babylon was in charge of all the legal issues and all of the governmental legal issues and uh, ownership of properties and that type of thing. It was a, uh, it was a very interesting uh, concept and, uh, and it worked very well for more than 400 years. And one of the things that was quite interesting is the ownership of land. With the agreement that came into place, then everybody in the known world, your your property that you said that you owned or that belonged to you because of a because it was inherited to you or, or you bought it or whatever, became null and void. And so the piece of property that you now have, that you call yours, with this particular agreement, yesterday you owned it, today you don't. It's owned, it was cut right down the middle, and the, the Gulf of Suez was the, was the boundary, and anything west of that, the pharaoh of Egypt owned it. Anything east of that, then Babylon owned it. But that wasn't the end of the issue, because you had the right then to claim as your own property that you feel like was yours. And the way you did that is that you made application to uh, Ur, to the government in Ur, and you said that on a certain, certain date, I am going to make claims on the property that I feel is mine. And so on a particular day, you would start at sunrise, and you had three witnesses with you. And those three witnesses, one had to be a government official, and so you had two witnesses that were not government, and then one that was. And so at sunrise, then you began to walk, and you can also use a wagon or a horse or anything else you wanted to, but the, but the provisions of the agreement is a walk, walk in the land. And so you walked in a straight line until the sun went down. When the sun went down, you would mark that place, and the land that you walked in a straight line, all of that, plus the same distance to the right and to the left, now you could claim as your own. Now, the next day you started where you, let, where you, where you stopped and continued on. And in that way, uh, you, could, you make claim to what you want. Now, you register that claim in Ur. And once you register the claim in Ur, then they go through a legal process of investigation to see if anyone else is making a claim to that property and so on and so forth. And if everything is clear, within <clears throat> within 100 days, the property is yours. And it's registered, it's claimed, registered, and you become the owner in Ur. 
Now, this is what happened in the case of Abraham. God gave Abraham in, the, in Genesis, uh, uh, we're not going to read it, but just for your reference, in Genesis 15 and 18, um, God told Abraham, he said, look to the north, look to the south, the west, the east. All the land that you see, I give it to you. And the stipulations of the Genesis 15 uh, basically says from the Euphrates River to the Nile River. And all of that land I will give to you. Now, Abram now could make a petition. He could make application saying that this land is my land, and so now I want to register it, and I want to uh, identify it as mine. <clears throat> but just like today, in, in today's society, perhaps your pastor, when this land was, was just a field of nothing, a cotton field, and he stepped out on that land because he felt that God was telling him, this land is going to be yours and the church that you are going to build. And he could claim that. He could say, God said this land is mine. Or maybe uh, the members of the board of the church felt that God is saying, this piece of property is ours. But does that make it yours? No. Because what makes it yours is a little piece of paper they call a deed. And with that piece of paper, that deed, then it becomes legally yours. Now, God said you could have it. But until you do obey the laws of the land, and until you do the things that the law says you must do, then it's not yours. Same thing with Abraham. Turn with me, if you will, to, um, to Genesis, the um, 13th chapter. Very quickly. Genesis 13. Uh, verse number 14. This is after a lot separated from, uh, from Abram. And this is what it says. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look for the place where thou art northward, southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And the back of that uh, Genesis 15, you'll know, you, you know what that land was. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise. Now this is the legal, the legal aspects. This is what God is telling Abram. Obey the law of the land. Arise. Walk through the land, the length of it, the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And that was the legal things he must do. But notice what Abram did. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt, or set up a house, basically. Dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Now the provision says that you walk this piece of property that you are claiming is yours. 
if you don't get a chance to do it before you die or before you get too old uh, to do it, then your son can do it for the next generation. And if he doesn't do it, then his son can do it. So you got three generations to make this claim. Abram did walk from the northern border to the southern border of what is now the Negev or up to Aqaba. He also walked from the east to the west, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. But then he stopped. He set up his tent at Mamre and stayed there. But now his son, Isaac, can pick up the mantle and, and, and pursue it and do the same thing. In this case, Isaac could have carried on, but Isaac also did not. They went from the northern to the southern, east and west borders of what is presently now the borders of present-day Israel, the nation of Israel. Okay, so Isaac did not do it. So now it's up to the other generation. We have Jacob or Esau who could do the same thing. Jacob did not do it. But there was a son of Abraham that did walk. That son's name was Ishmael. And this is why today, and Ishmael went into collaboration with Esau, and this is why today the sons of Ishmael are the dominant residents from the Euphrates River to the Nile River and from the Mediterranean to the Arabian Sea. And they will continue to occupy that area. Now, there's one small portion that Abram did not walk. He called it, they called it Gier. Gier was a, uh, was a little place, uh, a little kind of a carve out of Cana, uh, next to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the Abimelech was the, uh, was the king there, and Abram had uh, difficulties with him. That was next, the next time that Abram lied about Sarah being his his his, uh, his his sister and wife and so forth was there at Abimelech. Well, Abram did not walk that area. He left it to Abimelech. He left it to to Gier. That particular piece of land is now called the Gaza Strip. So because he did not, Abram did not fulfill the uh, obligation that he had, we're still having difficulties today. So it's very important when God tells us to do something, we do it. Now, Ishmael became very powerful. It took him and his sons and his grandsons 138 years to walk this land. But at the end of that 138 years, they owned the Euphrates to the Nile and still do today. But not only was he powerful as far as land was concerned, Ishmael actually became a pharaoh. Uh, and Mahashiach was his, well, he was the first pharaoh. And not only him, but for six generations, the offspring of Ishmael became the uh, pharaohs of Egypt. And they 
were very powerful in what they, uh, they were somewhat ruthless, but they were very powerful. The last of the reign of Ishmael's uh, lineage was Sinoseret the third, and he was the pharaoh that was ruling at the time that Joseph was sold into slavery into Egypt. Hi, I'm Dr. Ron Charles of the Cubit Foundation. You know, we've been in Middle East for going on 30 years. And I would love to come to your church or your meeting to let you know what's happening uh, in reality in the Middle East. And I uh, would love to come there and let you know what's happening, what the Lord's doing in that part of the world. So if you can contact us at the thecubitfoundation.org, then we could come to your place. And if you would like to find out more about us, then go to www.cubitfoundation.org. Dr. Ron Charles has spent over 50 years researching and uncovering the truths about the life of Jesus and information that proves the historical authenticity of the Bible. Gleaned from his years of tireless work, research, ministry, and archaeological work, and watch the pages of the Bible come to life like never before. Go to cubitfoundation.org and place your order today. All proceeds go directly to Cubit Foundation's efforts around the world.